Who is God? Who is God? God is the highest, most unapproachable being. Everything that exists, he created it. We read in 1 Corinthians that there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. He's all-powerful, often described as the Almighty. Almighty. As the great multitude in Revelation exclaims, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Or as we see in the King James, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. You can even dig into the meaning of the original word that John wrote down. What is the word for almighty? What is the word for omnipotent? The Greek word is pantocrator. Helps word studies says that this means unrestricted power exercising absolute dominion. Thayer's Greek lexicon defines it as he who holds sway over all things. His power is not restricted. His sway is over all things. He is unlimited. There's no force that can stand against him and succeed. Everything was created by him, and anything can be wiped from existence by him as well. He is unmatched. When he reveals himself to Isaiah, it is a glimpse of of his unrivaled glory. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And what a sensical response. He is in fear and trembling before the awesome Lord of all because he knows he is unclean and he dwells in the midst of unclean people an uncleanness that God never allows in his direct presence. It's a death sentence. Elsewhere in the book, Isaiah says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the Spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it. And a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? 
Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. There is no lack in his understanding, in his wisdom, in his knowledge. There's no weariness that can slow him down. There's nothing that can outlast him. He is everlasting. And he hates sin. He is a punisher of sin. Again, we find in Isaiah more about the holiness of God. Chapter 11, he hates sin. God says, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an endlet or an end to the pomp of their arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I will make people more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. He is God angry with sin who is all powerful, all knowing of everything we've ever done wrong, every heart motive that we've produced that is evil, every thought that we've had that is bad. And so it looks like it's eternal doom for everyone. You do not mess with the holiest of all beings. So what happens when Isaiah meets God? What happens to him? Back to Isaiah 6, it says, Then one of the seraphim, the fiery angels, flew to me, having his hand in a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. What does it say in Isaiah before that large section of how much greater God is in every way than anyone else? It says in Isaiah 40, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. And in Isaiah 7, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us? Sinners who can't be in his holy presence, God with us? Isaiah is right when in the presence of the Lord he says, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. But now, that holy God is going to dwell among them, among people of unclean lips? God's love for us is unimaginable. In the same way that his holiness is unimaginable. In the same way that his understanding is unimaginable. In the same way that his power is unimaginable. His love for humanity is unimaginable. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 to 14, and we are going to see Jesus' parable about God's love, God's care for the lost. 
Last week we talked about Jesus' heart for who we might call the least of these. And his, his specific example was children. Become like children, as in humble yourselves, right? Become dependent on God. We also saw extremely strong words in verses 5 and 6 where he said, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. God cares about kids so much. God is serious about what he thinks of those who, leads kids, who, those who lead kids astray. He's serious about that. People who push them away from God and into sin. He is serious about that. There are woes to the tempters. There are other uncomfortable words that were said last week as well about cutting off hands and putting out eyes and the hell of fire. But then Jesus returns to the topic of the least of these and more specifically, kids. So this is Matthew 18 verses 10 to 14. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And when he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Lord, I thank you so much for your goodness, and I just pray that you would be with each one of us, giving us each understanding of your word in the name of Jesus, working on each one of our hearts in the name of Jesus. And Lord, if I do say anything that might be wrong or untrue, I pray that that would not be believed in the name of Jesus. I want your truths to be believed in the name of Jesus. So let that be the case. Let your truths be believed, let your truths be remembered, and let your name in this time be glorified In the name of Jesus, amen. Now let's start at the beginning here. Jesus says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. Now remember that Jesus is using a child as an example of those who might be considered the least of these. So it's talking about children, but not necessarily just children. Now, a question that often comes up these days, whether it's about just children or about the least of these or about believers in general, is does this verse mean that each one has their own guardian angel assigned to protect them? And the answer is not necessarily their own personal angel. We can't quite conclude that from Scripture. However, it is showing that at the very least, at the very least, and again, this could include all believers, this could include the least of these, but at the very, very, very least, children have angels. Now, is one angel assigned over a bunch of different children, or does each have their own angel, or... Does each have many angels? We don't know. We don't know. But this is given as a reason not to despise little ones, not to treat them poorly, not to lead them astray, because, hey, they have angels. And the angels are right there looking at the face of the Father who cares for those children. Jesus uses this to transition into his next point, which comes by way of parable. Now, it looks like he tells this parable on two separate occasions. Uh, This time it's told in reference, of course, to not despising children or the least of these. God saying, I, God, do not despise them. I actually rejoice in them. Verse 12, Jesus says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. Now in the middle of this, 
You may have noticed, if you're reading another version, there's actually a missing verse. Verse 11 is not there. Now again, one of these, it's one of these things where this verse is not in the majority of the ancient manuscripts, but all that means is in this case that it's unlikely that this verse was supposed to be for this story because this verse is actually pulled from the story of Zacchaeus, which is only in the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. So it's a verse that is true. Absolutely, it's true. It's just not likely a part of this story. However, it still goes very well with this story because verse 11 tells us why Jesus came to earth, why the Lord decided to be born into this world of sin and treachery, why the holy Lord humbled himself to the manger. He came for who Isaiah said he was when he saw the Lord. Remember what Isaiah said, woe is me for I am lost. What does the missing verse 11 say? It says, for the Son of Man came to save the lost. What does Luke 19.10 say? For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And what is he doing in this parable? A sheep has gone astray. A picture of all of us, right? Something that Isaiah also points out. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord goes out and he seeks and saves the lost sheep. With the 99 already high up on the mountain, he goes down from them, goes down the mountain, and he searches for that lost sheep. And when that sheep is found, there is great rejoicing. Now, the other time that he tells this parable, the context is a little different. Luke records this account and he says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So we told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Heaven rejoices. The heaven that cannot accept sinners. It doesn't mean that it doesn't want to accept them. Because when they are found, again, when there is true repentance, heaven rejoices. Jesus actually tells a second parable here as well. He says, or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Joy before the angels of God. Joy before the angels of God. Because that's what brings them joy. That's what brings God joy. That's why he came in the first place. When Christ is born and the shepherds are in their fields and the angel appears before them and they are in fear, what does Luke tell us? And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. This is the good news of great joy that humanity has a Savior, 
Good news of great joy for all people, but also for the angels who want to see people saved, who take joy in seeing the lost found, just like their master, just like the Lord who came to save us, who was wrapped in swaddling clothes, who was placed in the manger. He came down from being God Almighty, the Lord Omnipotent, to be a little baby as a part of his plan for salvation, as a part of his plan to come to seek and save the lost. We mentioned this on our, at our Bible study on Tuesday, but what does the entire Bible point to? What does the entire Bible point to? What does Paul tell Timothy about the scriptures in his letter that he wrote to Timothy? He says, from childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. This book points to Jesus and the salvation that comes through faith in him. And one day in Bethlehem, that one day it all began. The Lord came looking for the lost. And he would eventually make a way to gather them about 33 years later on the cross. We talk a lot about gifts this time of year. It's nice to get gifts from others. It's often also very nice. It also often very much feels good to give gifts to others. And while there is no greater gift that we could ever receive than the Lord's salvation, access to heaven to be with our loving God forever. But wow, is there ever joy from the gift giver when we receive that gift? He wants us to, to accept his gift, his inexpressible gift, so badly. And he's made it so easy for us to obtain. No, the Christian life itself is not easy. We go through a lot of hard times while we're still on the earth, but how we actually acquire the gift, how we actually receive it, how we actually accept it, that has been made easy. The life that Jesus was born into, he lived perfectly according to the law. 1 Peter 2 verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. He was human like the rest of us, but a human who never sinned. 1 John 3 verse 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. And because he's a human who, unlike the rest of us humans, never sinned, he could take our punishment upon himself, becoming the sacrifice for sin. Paul says to the Corinthians, for our sake, he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, to be sin, the sin offering, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you know what he did with the record of debt that stood against us for our sin? Colossians 2.14, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Jesus was born to die for you. God came down and was born to live a perfect human life on earth so that he could offer up that perfect life on the cross to justly save you from your sin. Everything was against you. Your sin held you back from entering God's heavenly presence. You faced the punishment of death and hell after. But God made a way to save you from all that because he loved you so much that you were counted as worth the living God coming to live in this sinful world to seek you and to save you through his death and resurrection. Now, what do we see in verse 14 of our main passage? It says, So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. 
Now again, when he says this, this is again talking about children. The context is talking about the child that he uses as an example to the disciples. And even though there's no verse that outright, there's no verse that outright says babies or children automatically go to heaven, I think that the Bible still gives us so much evidence for that that we can come to the conclusion that they do go to heaven. I won't get into that now, but I preached on it a year and a half ago. If you want to see those passages that really back that up, uh, you can always search up Wassa Community Church, What Happens to Babies. Um, it's on YouTube. It's on the website. But I'm convinced, I'm convinced that babies and children, to a certain extent of understanding, do end up in heaven if they die, even though they may not have the capacity to grasp the gospel and what Christ has done for them. This particular verse, however, as much as it shows the heart of God, it's not one of the verses that actually back up that claim, because we also have a very, very, very similar verse in 2 Peter 3, which says the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And that's talking about everyone in that verse. That's talking about everyone, not just kids, everyone which means people who are able to understand the gospel and who either accept it or reject it, God does not want them to perish. There's another one in Ezekiel where we see God's heart. As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live, turn back, Turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? This one's it's focused on Israel. But again, you see God's heart. He wants the people who are able to make the conscious choice of accepting him or rejecting him to accept him. But he is still a just God. I remember when I was little and I... I feel so bad about this. I really do. It it like makes me cringe when I think back about it. But I remember when I was little and I really liked uh, Goofy, the uh, Disney character, Goofy. And when I was three or four years old, uh, I really wanted this Goofy piggy bank. And my parents got it. But when Christmas came around and I saw it, I yelled, I already got this. Because my aunt had also gotten it for me. And that made her feel really bad. And it was awful. I was three or four, but even then, right, I I knew better than to act like that. I apologize later, but yeah, there are times where gifts are rejected. And much like when our gifts are rejected, when God's gift is rejected, it also makes him feel not that great, right? It breaks his heart. There are times where people want to stay lost. And if that's the case, as much as God takes no pleasure in it, he will still punish sin. If you reject the free coverage in Christ, then there is still the hell of fire. If you don't want what he came down and shed his perfect blood to get you, then you don't have to have it. And like the author of Hebrews says, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Don't neglect it. Remember the joy of the angels of God. Remember the joy of God himself in you receiving that gift. He wants you to take it. He wants you to take it. And and you take it by placing that genuine, repentant belief in Christ and what he did for you in dying for your sin on the cross and rising again. You're saved by grace through faith, not through your good works or or merit at all. Another thing Isaiah says is, we have all become like one who is unclean. Unclean, just like those people he was around and just like his lips, unclean. 
And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. The NIV puts it this way. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Filthy rags. That's what our good works, our righteous acts, our own merit. That's what that adds up to. It's not enough for heaven. So thanks be to God that through faith, Christ's perfect work can be our coverage. That through faith, Christ's own righteousness that was good enough for heaven can be placed upon us. Now for us who have already accepted that gift of salvation, I know that for some, of course, this season brings a lot of joy, but it also can bring a lot of heartache and perhaps loneliness. Either way, remember that there's always someone who takes joy in you and has prepared for you a place in heaven. Earth might not be giving you the best, but you don't really need Earth's best. You've already got God's best waiting for you up there, and right now, you have the best thing of all, right? God himself already with you. Why don't I conclude with a few words from where else but Isaiah, God says in Isaiah 43, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba as in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. Bow with me in prayer. Thank you so much, Lord for your goodness, for your love. It's really almost unbelievable that you as the holy of holies, the holiest one, the separate one, the all-powerful one, the creator of all things would come down and humble himself to a manger, to be born into humanity, to come to a sinful world that you could not stand the sin of it. But you love those affected by the sin so much that you still came among us eventually to die for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. We can't thank you enough, but as we reflect on this season as, as we see um, different things and hear different tunes and, and different hymns and songs and carols. And uh, as we go through this holiday, as Christmas comes up, help us to be so, so focused on you. Help us to reflect well on what you've done for us because it is amazing the fact that you came to this earth because of who you were? Be That's just amazing, Lord. So thank you, Lord, and be with us and help us to really know that you're there. Help us to know that we are a joy to you. Help us to know that you love us so much and help us to live for you in this time as well so that more people can come to you so that your joy is increased even more at more lost sheep who are found. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.